as I'm not sure exactly who's here, my name's Robin Clark. I'm chief coach of the Southern Hang Gliding Club. I first met Ben Bowler about five years ago in the Himalaya. Um, a young guy who had a bicycle and a paraglider. And that's how he got there. Um, earlier this year, I saw Ben uh, in the Southern Club where he did his advanced pilot exam successfully passed and I thought there was a price to pay for that and um, how about you come along and give us a tour but because I thought it was going to be of widespread interest I suggested we did it as a zoom call rather than as a physical meeting uh, in blind which is what we normally do um, invite other clubs and put it up on YouTube to give it as wide an audience as it deserves uh, just a couple of brief housekeeping announcements before we hand over to Ben. Um, I think everybody's muted. Um, please do mute yourself. Um, if we have trouble with bandwidth, we might have to ask people to turn off video as well. Um, if you've got any chest questions to ask, what I suggest is you put them on the chat, um, which appears somewhere at the bottom of yeah, the, the bottom of the uh, the Zoom screen. I'll try and keep an eye on that. As far as possible, we'll let Ben go through his presentation and then he's kindly agreed to stay on at the end and take questions and, and have a discussion. But if there is anything that wants clarifying along the way, we can do so. Um, that's all I've got to say now. Before we hand over to Ben, are there any questions to start with or shall we go? All right, let's go. All yours, Ben. Fantastic. Thanks, Robin. So the story starts for me growing up in a small Norfolk village, and uh, it felt very, very small at the time, and I always dreamt of freedom. For a lot of my friends, the freedom really came when they got their first car, like a Ford Fiesta, and ripped it around the local lanes. But for me, it came in two forms, flying and my bicycle. On my 12th birthday, my dad got me a flight at Tibbetum Gliding Club, um, and I really loved the experience of silently circling above the fields with the wind whistling through the little window, and uh, I was hooked from that moment on. My early flying career, uh, I got as much as I could um, in any way I could. So I joined Beckles Air Cadets, uh, and I flew in the Grob Tutors, helicopters like the Squirrel and the Sea King. Um, I was awarded a flying scholarship and got two um, weeks, including 20 hours of flying at Dundee to fly solo. And I joined the 611 VGS gliding school in Watton, where I was there volunteering for three years, trained to be instructors uh, and instructor on the Viking gliders. On my 16th birthday, my dad got me another present that changed my life. And that was this. It's, um, it's a steel bike frame that he got from uh, a friend of his who uh, owned a bike shop that he used to live above. So this was in the back of the shop. It was an old uh, Doors touring bike that had been stripped for parts. All the parts had gone for other bikes. Um, and he gave it to me just like this on my 16th birthday. And I used parts that I bought on eBay and secondhand and scrounged from, from the side of the road, old wheels and things like that. Uh, and I taught myself to build up every part of a bike from running the cables, fitting the bottom bracket and building my own wheels as well. Over the next summer I cycled from Norwich to Genoa in northern Italy and then the following year I cycled from Norwich to Barcelona and all the way back and at the time all I had was an atlas map and I traced with a pencil roughly where I was going to go I woke up every morning started the morning with the sun to my left and kept cycling with the sun to straight ahead of me at midday for lunch of fresh fresh French bread and then the sun to my right as I finish the day. In the following years, I moved to London for work, which made my pursuit of flying a little bit more complicated in terms of powered flying or, or fixed wing gliding. Uh, but around that time, I saw this documentary online called Temple in the Clouds. And this was really the kind of opening of my eyes to the paragliding world. And what really excited me about it was the ability for a real expedition, like the trips I'd done already on the bike, being able to cover serious ground with the flying machine in a rucksack. If you haven't seen that documentary, I will share the link to it 
afterwards. Um, but here's a little clip so you get a taster of, of why I found this so uh, exciting at the time. My name is Jim Allenson. This is my friend Enrico Patuzzi, a.k.a. Kiko. And this is the story of our journey to the temples in the clouds. The temple of Himani Chamunda is on the mighty Dauladhar mountain range, which runs west from our takeoff point at Billing towards Dharamsala, the home of the Dalai Lama. It is only 40 kilometers away from Billing, but is rarely reachable by paraglider because it is almost always in the clouds by the time one gets there. We plan to stop and camp for a night along the way so that we can take off early the next day and reach the temple before the clouds descend. It's amazing to see the kind of uh, well all of the equipment but even the film you know the film equipment is so fun there and the music choice and the editing is, is quite fun to watch these days when you look at what's on YouTube but um, still really watching it today the story of the journey and the way they're able to travel with paragliders is is still inspiring uh, when I watch it back in 2018 my life my and work uh, lined up Oh, sorry. So, yeah, after I saw that documentary, I got back on the bike and I cycled across Spain um, to fly Spain. And that's where I learned to fly um, literally the next year. And then the next year after that, in 2018, my work and life lined up and I decided to go go for it with my biggest dream of all, which was to cycle around the world. And now with my newfound passion for paragliding, there was no way I wasn't going to figure a way to bring my paraglider with me. So I packed up my stove and uh, my laptop, my bivy, and I got a lightweight B glider. It's the Skywalk Ariba. Um, with all the cycling I was doing, uh, I was super light. <laughs> so I got that smallest version that you can buy, um, which helped with the size as well and the weight. I got the Niviet Roma 2 harness and uh, a reserve as well and an extra helmet. And that all fitted inside the bike uh, pannier bag along the top of my uh, my touring bike. I planned my first leg from London to Sofia in Bulgaria, and uh, I, I departed the day after the royal wedding. So as I rode out from Buckingham Palace, they had the Union Jacks left up. I like to think they left them up for me down the mall. I cycled with a group of friends and family to Canterbury on the first day, um, and then the next day I was alone on my way to Dover and across to Europe. The first leg was uh, the first chance I'd had to try all the kit together and it was far and away the heaviest bike I'd ever ridden, even with certain things that I kind of threw away along the first few days that I realized I didn't really need. The bike together with the kit, the full panniers, the bar bag and the paraglider came to almost 50 kilos. I was using the Camus app to plan the routes, which went pretty well, um, pretty smoothly across um, across France and uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, until I got to Switzerland, where I went off the nice smooth roads down what turned out to be a smaller and smaller and smaller path. Um, and as I was kind of spinning and going into a low and lower and gear, all of these Swiss cyclists were passing me, always all on full sus mountain bikes, um, all going super fast, you know, in full lycras and everything like that. So my huge 50 kilogram bike, I wound my way up this path. It got narrower and narrower and I dropped well into the lowest gear. I had to get off and push. The path turned into a full on mountain bike track. I had to stop multiple times. I was dripping in sweat and it took me two or three hours to get to the top of the trail. And by the time I got there, all the mountain bikers were sitting in a cafe, sipping a cup of coffee and gave me a little round of applause as I appeared over the horizon. That's the track there heading off into the hills. 
Sofia was my first paragliding stop. Um, I was also stopping there to work in a co-working space in the city. And what I loved about the, the city is that you could, or I could check out from work a little bit early. I could get on this bus that took me up Vitosha, which is a massive, um, that towers over the capital. And in a couple of hours, I could be flying, flying along the ridge there, picking up small thermals, um, or heading down into the landing field to hitchhike back into town. It was a nice, calm introduction to flying, the more extreme mountain flying that were to come. Um, and I spent several days there between, between work, um, flying around the local area. Here's the video of that, uh, that experience. Two hours, two buses winding up the little roads here. Clouds are closed in a bit, but they're still about 2,000 meters, which is about 200 meters above launch. So we see if we can get a nice little top to bottom in. Clouds means no thermals, but we still get a good half an hour flight when the launch is uh, almost 2,000 meters high. So the next leg was from Sofia in Bulgaria via Istanbul and down south to Ulodinis. After a few days of staying in Istanbul, I took uh, a ferry to Medanya, which leaves directly from the center of Istanbul, which helped save some cycling through uh, Istanbul's infamous traffic, which I'd spent two or three days um, on cycling into um, Istanbul from the west. So far in the trip, I'd stayed pretty fit and healthy. It was about a month in at this point. Um, However, I made my first mistake by buying a lukewarm pastry on the ferry. And whatever was still living in that pastry took just a long enough for me to cycle about 100 kilometers away from the nearest town along these incredible remote gravel trails throughout rural Turkey to really hit me hard. And I spent uh, just over a night and a day um, vomiting in my tiny little bivy or under a nearby tree, using up all the extra supplies of water and food that I had until after those 36 hours of sickness, I pushed my bike into the nearest small village, which was just a few small house, houses with no shops or, or public water either. I stopped in the street and some local women were, were uh, hanging up washing and noticed my plight looking at me and immediately realizing that I wasn't well. And one of the families took me in uh, gave me fresh bread, fresh tomatoes. I really remember the, the taste of the tomatoes. A uh, toilet to use, which was critical at the time. And I lay sleeping in their courtyard under a tree for the remainder of that day, which brought me back to life. They filled up my bottles of water, gave me some extra tomatoes and dates, and I was able to continue on the journey, building up the distance and as my strength regained over the coming days. That's the infamous ferry. I didn't get a photo of the pasty. Oladinis was my next stop, and this is a real shock as a you know new, newly qualified pilot, um, and also just being from cycling in Turkey to uh, to being around Brits abroad on holiday as well. I got a fantastic apartment, and I loved watching gliders come down onto the beach. And I unpacked my wing and had a ground handle on the beach, as I'm sure anyone who's been to Oladinis knows. It's an incredible place to be as someone that loves paragliding. My first flight from 
Babadag launch was genuinely terrifying. Uh, having flown from a maximum of four or 500 meter high launches in Spain during my training, um, that 2000 meter drop away from the launch to the sea really took my breath away. Also, I found fighting with the lightweight wing on the smooth bricks um, was really tricky. The wing kept skittering kind of left and right in the, the wind as it came around the, the side of the launch there. And obviously, again, as anyone who's been to the will know, um, the bus loads after bus loads of tandems that shoulder, showed you out the way were um, key elements that added to the workload. But I soon got to the hang of things. I learned how to kind of choose the better launches, not just going for the one that all the tandems are going for. Sometimes picking some of the higher launches that were a little quieter and picking my time to fly. I particularly enjoyed sunrise flights, getting up early and being on the first minibuses um, to, to be there for sunrise. This is one of my most memorable flights where I got up early enough that there was a, still a layer of cloud well below at a few hundred meters high and I was able to play around in the clouds. I also did an epic hike and fly. Uh, I left before sunrise and climbed the full height of Babadag on foot, uh, which took over four hours of hiking and scrambling. At the time, they were just finishing building the cable car, so they had the path sort of became the, the construction tracks higher up. Um, and I got there as a lot of the minibuses were arriving uh, to the launch site. Unfortunately, it's something that's not maybe not as possible to do now. I tried when I was there la uh, last year, but with the new ticketing system, you have to be you have to buy your ticket for the, that day at 10 a.m. from the, the the ticket booth down the bottom. So unless you leave a lot later, um, it's not so good for, for hiking up there now.
maybe there's a way you can sneak around the uh, security at the top. I don't know. For the next leg, um, I took, I rode across the entire of Turkey, which if I, if I didn't know it at the time, I now know is incredibly mountainous country over just two weeks of cycling. I climbed over three times the height of Everest, a lot of it on, um, gravel trails, very, very remote gravel trails. Um, the scenery was vast and some of the favorite, some of my favorite in the trip by far. I would camp on one side of the mountains in the forest with nobody around for miles and miles and miles. The nearest people would be a small speck of a village on the other side of the valley, which you could judge the scale by, by the minarets of the mosques, which were tiny little dots in the distance. Along the way, I saw many Roman sites across Turkey. Um, but one of the highlights for me for sure was the Ishak Pasha Palace, which is this incredible structure that overlooks this vast valley. And on the other side is Turkey's largest mountain, which is a, a dormant volcano, which uh, even towards the end of the summer had um, a huge amount of snow on top. And it was visible for about two to three days while I was cycling uh, up to this plateau. So my next stop was uh, Tbilisi, where I'd be stopping, um, again, renting another apartment to work um, and be based for a few weeks. Before I reached the city, I joined the Georgian Paragliding Federation pa Facebook page, and um, it was a great connection. Within a few days, they let me know they were doing some training on a local grassy slope, which overlooks the capital, which itself is in a long uh, river valley. And so I flew some top to bottoms, getting uh, a lift up in a pickup truck back to the top and to repeat uh, and made some friends there, which came in handy later on uh, in, in the week. I rented a four by four and I drove out into the mountains with uh, some sites in mind that I'd been told about by my new uh, Georgian paragliding friends. I spent a night sleeping in a freezing four by four before I reached the Georgia Russia Peace Monument um, where there was a paragliding site nearby. When I got to the site, there was two groups of pilots. There was the Georgian and the Russian, and they definitely weren't very friendly, despite the name of the monument. And they were competing to run tandems up the valley um, for the sort of small flow of tourists that were coming through. If I thought that Olodinus was intimidating at the time, these mountains were even more so for a green pilot like me. The wind was whipping up the valley, and there was about 20 to 30 kilometer hike from the bottom landing if you didn't make it for the top landing but it was incredibly invigorating as well. Uh, I took off, I flew over the valley, over the Peace Monument, uh, and did back up top landings, did a few flights down to the valley, and even um, joined some of the tandems and took off tandem flight as well while I was there. Some of the tandems were going up above this peak at the back. The camera lens makes the scale, uh, you know, it, it stretches the scale a little bit, but the mountain at the back was up to 5,000 meters high. Here's a little clip from that.
by this time, the winter was fast approaching and I had a big decision to make. I could spend about six months in Tbilisi or Baku in Azerbaijan, just in the Caucasus area generally, and wait for the snow to thaw in Kazakhstan and the, the, um, the stands in general. Or I could spend my winter by taking one flight on the beaches of Goa partying. So the decision wasn't too tricky. I boxed up the bike and I hopped on a flight to Mumbai. Uh, I rode out of the center of the city um, to sit on the beach and also saw the cliffs of Goa as well to bring in the new year in style. Over the next six months, I cycled the length and breadth of India down as far as Kochi, Bangalore and Pondicherry, and then right through the center of the country in Delhi and onto the Himalayas. India was constantly busy. I had nonstop crowds and attention the whole time I was traveling. And it was by far the longest leg. I traveled thousands and thousands of kilometers and village to village with little to no gap. It's truly a country of a million villages. The diverse culture and religion and the kindness of the people. And also for me as a vegetarian, the unlimited super hearty food made it by far my, one of my favorite um, and most rewarding uh, legs of the trip on the bike. Overall, I spent seven months in India and Nepal. Um, so again, by far one of the largest uh, portions of my trip. After a year of cycling, I finally reached the Himalayas where I was in the, uh, the world of the Temple of the Clouds documentary. Uh, from my hostel window, I could see the snowy mountains of beer behind. And I made a habit of walking up to launch, making friends with visited pilots from around the world, as well as the local mountain dogs who hiked up to launch. And on some off days when it wasn't flyable, we went for longer hikes and the, the dogs are always friendly and following as well. It's also where I met Robin and his group on the, the launch as well. And it really lived up to its expectations for me. Um, I, looking back, really, I, you know, I never flew beyond that first ridge um, with the kit that I had and the experience that I had. But still flying along that ridge was the furthest I'd ever flown. Um, and also learned a lot from the pilots that were there. I remember speaking a lot on launch and in the evenings at the, um, the landing side cafes and just learning so much as well as by learning by flying with the vultures and uh, seeing their amazing, amazing majesty and uh, prowess in, in thermaling versus my performance on the, uh, on the green wing. A few hundred kilometers along the road, I reached Pokhara. Um, and here I learned a useful lesson about flying with feel. As with beer, I was in an amazing routine. I had a great apartment overlooking the lake and I'd wake up in the morning, go to a local cafe for breakfast before hiking up in time for the thermals to begin kicking off around allegedly 10, 10.30 in the morning. And on the third or fourth day of flying, I hiked up with an American pilot who I'd got to know the day before when I opened my bag and I found that my Cyride Vario had been turned itself on in the bag overnight and the battery was completely drained. So I was completely sullen and I took off thinking that I would just have a top to bottom and go and try and hunt in town for some new batteries when just as I got towards that 
gaggle of pilots that you can see, uh, which was a regular sight over the house thermal. I felt the, uh, the wing pulling forward and then rocking back into the thermal. I could look around at the small sub bridges at the side and see the parallax effect of the trees in the background rising behind the trees in the foreground falling away. And um, I turned into the thermal and I paid attention to all the gliders around me, the birds around me, the seeds and grass in the air. And that flight was the longest flight I had of the whole time in Pokhara uh, with no vario. And I loved every, every second of it, feeling the air and really learning how um, to, to, to feel the signs of the air moving around you. There was quite a distance to the next paragliding site I was heading for, which was Bali with the cliffs and the, the big volcano on the north side. Um, my ride led me through the rest of Nepal um, up to um, Tilicho Lake, which is an ice covered, snow covered lake on the Annapurna circuit. Um, through Assam and Manipur, which are the eastern states of India. Through Myanmar with its golden pagodas, looping through Laos, Vietnam, uh, the Angkor Wat Temple complex in Cambodia. I slept on beach hammocks in Thailand, across Malaysia to Singapore. And finally, I caught a ferry from Singapore to Jakarta uh, for my final ride across Java Island to get the ferry to Bali. This was just before um, my life changed, as it did everyone. This was March time, 2020. So I was heading towards Bali to meet up with um, my now wife, actually, we were meeting there um, to, to spend a week or two working together when, and she'd been following more closely the news about coronavirus. I'd been hearing little bits here and there um, when I was in Jakarta, but I didn't really know a lot about it. And I wouldn't sh wasn't sure really what the impact would be on my trip. But she called me to say that it looked like it was going to be more serious than we th first thought. So I made a few calls and realized I needed to get back to the UK. So I was at this point 300 kilometers away from Jakarta in a small town. So I managed to find a taxi driver who I could pay $50 to, to drive me the, the 300 kilometers overnight in time for me to find a, a bike box, pack up all my gear and get on a flight the next day. So within 24 hours, I went from, uh, from cycling across every inch of the world to flying in 18 hours over the world that had taken me 18 months to travel um, by bike. And it really felt bittersweet to say the least. The trip wasn't finished and I was coming home to a lot of uncertainty, but looking back at the map on the, the plane as I flew by, I remembered that I'd been to the birthplace of Buddha and the birthplace of Stalin on my trip. I visited cathedrals, palaces, mosques, and temples. I spent nearly 300 nights sleeping wild under the stars, and I've been invited to stay with local families in a dozen countries, many more than I was able to talk about today. Yet, it became very, very clear as I landed as well that the trip would no longer have been possible. The next day, as I was on the plane, the Indonesian government stopped all ferry um, journeys between the islands and Australia, which was my next planned trip uh, or planned leg, closed their borders for much of the next year. So overall, in my round the world cycling attempt, I cycled 25,000 kilometers over 25 different countries and I flew in some of the world's best paragliding sites. I learned that often the tourist sites are not the most beautiful or the best food or the best places to stay. It's the least trodden places that are the best and most beautiful gems. I learned that it's possible to push your limits. I learned that in paragliding, you've got friends all around the world who will support you and they're all doing the crazy things that you're doing. And above all, I learned how large the world really is by covering only a quarter of its circumference, pedal stroke by pedal stroke.
So since I've been back in the UK, I've been focusing on a few adventures that I had on the bucket list that weren't possible to tie up with a round the world trip. Most recently, I cycled across the Hajar Mountains in Oman, um, which again, I climbed the height of Everest in six days, um, camping wild in the desert. And um, I've been uh, taking part in the hike and fly scene here in uh, the UK. So I started with the Dragon Hike and Fly last year um, and I'm doing both the Dragon Hike and Fly and the X Lakes um, this year and I'm hoping to build up on those trips as well as some solo hike and fly adventures um, in the coming months as well and years. I'm also at the Norfolk Toe Club quite regularly where I've actually got my my personal best distance flight is still uh, at the Norfolk Club so we get some serious distance especially because we've got an, this nice electric winch which gives us some uh, good height in thermic conditions. Um, and living in London I'm regularly flying in the South Downs and Thames Valley, South East Wales as well. You can see all of the extended video diaries and written diaries as well from the trip um, on my website, which is benbola.com. And I'm sure I'll see, and I'm, I recognize a few of your names as well. So I'm sure you, I'll see you all on, uh, on hills around the country and uh, the world soon as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. That's been a fascinating and inspirational talk. Um, if you could spare us a few more minutes, is there anyone that's got a question for Ben? If so, you should be able to unmute yourself and uh, and speak. If you have trouble, try and put something in the chat and I'll keep an eye on it. Perhaps I can kick off with a question, Ben. Um, do you think it would be possible to do that trip nowadays? And what did you do for insurance? Because we hear a lot oh. about how difficult it is to get search and rescue and medical insurance, how expensive it is, how it's time limited. What did you do then? And what could you do now? Yeah, that's a that is a really interesting question. I I think it's definitely definitely possible to do uh, in in the pure the practicalities of it today uh, for sure. I think um, there's many people doing many amazing trips. That's one thing I found one of the things on my YouTube channel actually as a podcast series where I I, start, I met so many people along the way that were doing weird and interesting things on bikes, hiking, running. You know um, that I actually started interviewing them, other people that I met along the way. So there's definitely a lot of people out there doing interesting things around the world. Insurance is a good question, actually. I used um, uh, the, 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 the travel agency that, was, that went bust during COVID. They had a really good um, world travel policy that is, was suited for me because the problem with a lot of insurance policies for long-term travel is that... Um, that's not what they're designed for, right? They're ma often their maximum 30 days. You have to be back in the country every 30 days, which obviously doesn't work for a trip like a trip like this. Is it STS, STS travel or something like that? Uh, but they've gone bust now, unfortunately, so the, they won't be an option really for this kind of thing. I know just from the more of the work side, you know, the digital nomad traveling and working side, there are insurers that will do long-term um, health cover for, for that kind of long-term remote work. But again, when it comes to paragliding cycling that kind of thing it's it's not there's not many um if any that i know of insurance wise that would cover it unfortunately it's an interesting aspect of it that uh did you that, travel with a that changes. garmin or a spot or any other yeah i had the spot i had the spot yeah so i had i had um i i sent i had like the the spot map and i would send a pin every twice a day and had that going to twitter and to my family as well and then obviously the emergency button was all set up on that um interestingly though like you know the world is getting smaller in terms of connectivity so apart from even the the tillichow lake annapurna circuit you know with exceptions of maybe at the lake at five thousand meters above the snow line there was you know there was wire uh, phone signal and you know 
it, wired internet and everything at the at the buildings all the way up there. So um, the world is incredibly, you know, connected a lot more now. But uh, but yeah, I had a spot for for a lot of those situations where I was between between the masts, and uh, I've upgraded to the the inreach too for for the Oman trip and and for paragliding as well. So it's definitely a useful thing to to have. Anybody else got a question for, for Ben? Yeah, I've got one. Go, ahead. Um, yes. Go on, Tom. Uh, thanks, Ben. I'm I'm totally blown away by that. That just looks like the most awesome trip I've ever seen. Um, just a just a quick question. Do you, did you have any truly scary experiences either in the air or on the ground? I it's interesting. I, I think um, I actually I get asked that a lot from when I mentioned the trip, I think more from the cycling side, I suppose is where most people know about the cycling actually around the world. I found, um, I didn't, I had, I literally have no major kind of scary moments to think of. I think the mo I actually find it a lot more scary to, to ride in, uh, to, to ride my bike in the UK with just the kind of the attitude towards cyclists with, from a lot of, uh, not a lot, but certain, a small sub, a loud subset of drivers, I think. But yeah, I mean, the, you know, people would expect that riding in somewhere like India where, you know, the roads are incredibly wild and you're, you're competing with rickshaws, cars, cows, um, that that would be kind of intimidating and scary. But I think because there's that's all going on there's a great kind of equalizing fact of that like the people in the four by fours aren't going anywhere because the cows have decided that they're going first so there was a great kind of equalizing power and flow with with that that came with that craziness i think in terms of flying i think you know i was very early on in my flying career flying in some of these really you know big sites and big spaces the you know particularly flying in georgia that was really out there um those sites were were definitely scary. I, I will admit now I was scared flying there. Um, but I didn't really push it. Like I say, I didn't go, I didn't go into the mountains at all, actually during the trip anywhere um, that maybe I would feel more comfortable with now. Um, and I did find good support there. You know, in the UK, we say about finding, getting a, a site briefing from, from a local pilot that's, you know, not formalized everywhere, obviously, but I effectively got that everywhere that I, I went, whether it was, you know, the training slope in Georgia and then the mountains they gave me and then being on the site there in, in that video, you can see me top landing. And one of the people that I made friends with there is like guiding me in to the top landing. So with the support of local pilots everywhere, I found um, that I flew in my comfort zone. And there was, you know, there was a lot of times where I chose not to fly as well. Um, so, you know, um, it's about making that decision I found um, along the way. But uh, but yeah, overall, it was. I didn't have any kind of crazy scare experiences out of those 300 nights camping for example i was only occasionally people would come over and say what the hell is this guy doing um generally just for a conversation there's only once when i was asked to move which is because i was camping beside a, a temple in india and they asked me to move to the other side of the road so i wasn't so close to the temple but other than that yeah mo more likely people would come and say to to ask if i wanted to come and stay um stay with them I've got a question on the chat, Ben, from Tim Chapman. How many yes. punctures? What would you leave <laughs> behind that you took with you and then ditched? Yeah, I took. That's a funny one. I I put in that in that little summary clip. I was looking for videos to put in the the last video there, and I found that picture of me pumping up my tire in the in the uh, in the rain. Yeah, in, amazingly, like I had less punctures than you expect. I have these incredible marathon tires. The thing that got them in the end was the. In countries where they don't have regulations over the tires like the metal wire comes out of the truck tires and then you just find big bits of metal wire in the in the tires and there's nothing you can do about that so i don't know i wouldn't be able to count <laughs> i would say i had like you know um i had some weeks where i didn't have any but then i'd have weeks where i would be absolutely fed up you know five punctures a day or something for the week and it'd be be miserable especially if it was raining um but yeah in terms of kit you, you saw in that first photo maybe like I had because I was in such a rush to kind of meet the deadline when everyone was cycling with me I kind of didn't really have time to sort and figure out and pack properly so when I left Buckingham Palace I had like shoes and coats and things just like strung onto the outside of my bags loosely um, the things that I lost actually pretty quickly were a lot of the filming gear I started out with actually a bigger camera like a sort of um, a Sony camera like this and um, 
because of the way the bike was set up, I had my phone like locked onto my uh, handlebars and I had the 360 camera, which um, was, it was the old version because the, you know, there's a few new, few new generations since then of the Insta360, but I had the old version that I had on my helmet or a st selfie stick. And um, I had all this extra stuff, tripod, bigger camera. And I just never got that out. The phone would be right there or the, the, the camera would be on my head. So I would just press the button or pull the phone off if something interesting happened to film it. And um, so I got, I managed to get my sister to eBay that. And I went to a French post office and, and uh, posted that back to the UK within a few days because um, I found I wasn't using it. Um, I mean, looking back now with my recent trips I've done to Oman, the kit has come on so far. I'm using these bike packing bags on the carbon bike. The whole bike is like, you know, a quarter of the weight of the, the new, of, of that bike. Um, so, you know, nowadays I'm going super, super lightweight, but for that one, it was about comfort really. I wasn't in a rush to get anywhere. Um, I managed, averaged about hundred kilometers every day, but that was over 10 hours normally cycling a day. So that's like, you know, 10 kilometers an hour, which is a very, very leisurely pace to cycle. Um, so I was happy to have the creature comforts when I was working. I had a, you know, a pair of trainers and a pair of sandals and, uh, you know, the laptop and a couple of extra shirts and, and a couple of, a lot of extra kind of pairs of pants and stuff. So things that you wouldn't, I wouldn't take on a shorter trip now, but for that longer trip, it was, was all part of the experience really. Perhaps I could ask a corollary question, which is you were restricted by what you could carry on your person and on your bike. Is there anything that you wish you could have had that the practical reasons weren't able to take with you? <laughs> I mean, you're sort of compromising for, for each scenario. It comes back to what we were just chatting about a little bit at the beginning before, before we started, but you sort of, you know, with the bike, you're carrying extra stuff, which makes some of the cycling not as fun as if you were on a lightweight bike for when I was working, you know, I had the, the tiniest laptop I could buy. So I was like, you know, doing coding work on a tiny, tiny screen, um, for paragliding, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I would have loved to have, have on, on, on the like for the flying side of things that maybe maybe would have meant that I could have done bigger tr flights or that kind of thing. But I don't know. I think looking back, I wouldn't really change anything about it, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't think I would have changed anything about it, really. There's always more you can do, but at the end of the day, it's about just working with what you've got, I think, in, in these situations. So, um, yeah, I had enough for sure to, to enjoy it. Anyone else? We've got another one. Um, oh, yes. Again, we've got a couple actually. Um, yes. Yeah. So Brian's Brian one. Head. What yeah. class of wing was the lightweight one? Took you with you? Did you have any issues with it as a newer pilot? Yeah. So I mentioned it as this uh, Skywalk Ariba Two light, which is the lightweight. Actually, I don't know what it's a version of, but it's the the lightweight B um, mid B, I think, or um low b maybe but b wing um i th thought it was fantastic for the trip the main criteria for me when i bought it was weight and pack size um so you know i think the big thing i noticed when i got back to the uk was that was that it was wasn't super performant you know when i because I, I flew it for a little bit when i came back at the toe club even um and I just noticed that I was dropping out of the sky super quick, but for these kind of flights, it was, it was fine. And like I say, the main, the main, um, priority was, was weight and pack size. Um, but I've actually, I've been on the sky, the Skywalk Chili since, which is the high B and the full weight glider rather than the lightweight one. And I love it. It's fantastic. Like huge step up in performance from the lightweight, um, the lightweight one as a, a newer pilot, I didn't have any problems with it. I actually, I mean, I went straight onto the B, low B wings from, from when I trained, I got that Jin Atlas first and then I traded that in for the, the Ariba. So I quite like the B wings a little bit just cause they gave me a bit more, uh, a tiny bit more speed, which my problem, I being lighter weight was just being pulled around on launch a lot in stronger winds. So I actually quite enjoyed having a little bit more trim speed on the gliders than the big A wings and things. Cause I've tended to get pulled around with those quite a lot, um, when I was training and things. So. For me, I, I, that was a great fit at the time. I wouldn't have complaints about about it or and recommending those kind of gliders, definitely. We've got a follow-up from Tim Chapman. What's next on the bucket list? Do you want to fly out and finish off your trip? Uh, yes. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, my life's changed a lot since with work and life and everything. So I don't really have the drive to go back for a longer extended trip. I think for me, there's certain, also one of the realities of, uh, of the round the world trip is that, you know, I shared some of the highlights there, but like, you know, there were some stretches of two, three, four weeks of perfectly flat, busy back roads, you know, like particularly like cycling through the center of India, for example, between the spots like the Himalayas or Munar Hills, Munar tea fields in India, or, you know, the, the mountains in Myanmar and things. So for me, it's like, I'm kind of happy to pick off the, the places that I really, really want to go. So like I mentioned, I was in Iman in October. Um, adventure wise on the bike, I'm looking really excited about, uh, there's like a gravel route across the center of Iceland. I think that would be fantastic on the mountain bike. Again, that doesn't fit into a round the world trip really either because <laughs> you, you have to fly there and fly back. Um, and then South America, that's the biggest part of the trip that I really missed not getting to. I was planning to cycle from Colombia to Tierra del Fuego. Um, and that's the biggest part that I regret not completing. So definitely I'm planning, I've got a few plans for, for cycling in South America and also tying that up with some paragliding. I'd love to go flying in Colombia particularly. Um, again, now I've got uh, a bit more, a bit more skills. I think I can have a fantastic time there. So, yeah, that's that's on the the bucket list for sure. Is um, Iceland and some time, uh, some time flying and cycling in in uh, in Patagonia uh, for the cycling and Colombia for the flying. We talked earlier, Ben, about uh, the possibility of returning to beer with a little more flying experience under your belt. Yeah. Making it a bit more adventurous of a trip. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. I'd love to be able to, I, for all the hike and fly stuff, I've been, I've really got, I've got a really, really nice setup in terms of the harness wing, uh, well, wing I'd like to work on lightweight wise, but, um, but camping kit as well. So I'm really set for, for being able to, to fly and camp. So it'd be amazing to be back in beer for sure. Um, yeah, I'd love to do some camping out there. Uh, yeah, 100%. That'd be fantastic. Anybody else have a question for Ben? Sounds like we may have got away lightly. <laughs> One more chance. Okay, can I, um, on behalf of everybody, thank you for giving up your time this evening and the effort that you've obviously put into preparation of the pictures, the videos and so on. Um, we wish you well and hope to see you on our hills and perhaps we'll come back and do another talk uh, after you've been to South America. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, always happy to uh, to help out the club and um, yeah, looking I'm forward sure to I'm sure if, you know, if anyone's got everybody. any questions um, you can find Ben on something about telegram being him a message uh, hopefully yeah 100 uh, provided some inspiration for some of you because as ben showed you can do off an awful lot uh with a bit of determination even as a relatively low airtime pilot well there's lots of nice messages coming through of thanks i don't know if you can see them all ben mm. but uh, we do appreciate it and uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Look forward yeah, to seeing thanks you so again much. soon, Ben.